Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today, we have on with us a special guest, Guy White. Guy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jeffrey. Glad to be here. Now, Guy, the Daily Mail out of London just did a story on you, which was a fabulous story. You were married to Suzette Hubbard, the daughter of L. Ron Hubbard and Mary Sue Hubbard. Correct. Now, what I want to open the show talking about is how you and the daughter of Ron and Mary Sue Hubbard get married because love, courtship, and marriage in the Sea Org in Scientology is not like it is out here in the regular world. That's true. So when did you meet Suzette Hubbard for the first time? What's your background in Scientology that you would meet Suzette Hubbard? So how I met Suzette was I was on a special program called the Running Program, and that was as a result of having been busted off a post, um, which I can get into, but to answer your question specifically, and this program from the Rehabilitation Project Force, which is where I was, um, was being done in Griffith Park. It's a big park in Los Angeles. And you would run all day long around a pole. So there were RPF members who were assigned to do that. And um, that's where I met Suzette. Suzette was on, she was not on the RPF, but there were a handful of people who were high profile people um, who were doing that program part time. Now, just good guy, let me ask you this. It's, just, it's a, a question. Why do you run around in circles all day in the running program? What's supposed to be the what's called the end phenomena or the purpose? Why did Mr. Hubbard design this program? What one is supposed to achieve is to literally key out from what one is stuck in. Say that you were all wrapped up mentally, emotionally on some particular subject, right? But you weren't fully present and yourself. So in doing the running program, one gets released from or keyed out from whatever it is that you're stuck in. Okay, so now, so you finish the running program, Suzette finishes it, do you get, where do you go from the running program when you completed it? Do you go back to your job or do you get a new job? Um, no, I went back to the RPF. So, so um, this was just a one program uh, of many steps to complete to get off of the RPF. Oh, I see. Well, now w one thing we we talked about before this show after you after you finish the RPF, this gets really interesting. It, and um, so you go through the grind. That's the RPF. You graduate it with your twin. Correct. And then and then what we talked about, guy. You went into uh, the early events that, the so-called events that Scientology started doing. Yes, um, on completion of the RPF, I went on a project. That project was called Project Handle the Public. And it was, Irene Derman was the IC initially, and then she went off to do something else, and I was the in charge of that project. We had an, um, like I think, I believe it was 13 cities that were uh, named as the hot spots of Scientology. And what that meant was there were legal actions that were going on in that area and um, a bunch of people who were disaffected who were in the field. So it started out as, as a massive survey unit where we were contacting people who were with us, those that were sitting on the fence, and those that were against us. And in surveying them, we surveyed um, both people, public at both sides of the bridge, the training side and the processing side. So we would have, you know, maybe someone who's clear, but we would also have a class four auditor, you know, a class six auditor, class eight auditors. Um, and so that was done for each individual area. And there were some things that were common denominators that came up. Um, and we found uh, some of those key ones were that even public who were against Scientology at that time, they still were loyal to L. Ron Hubbard. So they could be complaining about the current management, they could be saying things aren't being done right, but they were loyal to L. Ron Hubbard. They would say, for example, like the current management isn't doing it like he would do it. 
Um, and they, uh, so that was one. The second one was they didn't know who was running the church. All of a sudden, there were actions that were being taken, like the um, bust of all the mission holders that had happened in uh, 82. Correct. Um, yeah. Yeah. The mission holder massacre. Correct. So um, you had upset with people, upset with the field. And so we, with those people, they wanted to know who was running the church. And in asking them what they wanted to those people to be, they wanted those people to be strong, effective at what they're doing, but they also wanted them to be approachable. And they wanted them to be putting in policy and managing things as L. Ron Hubbard would want it. Um, they would be on source. So the en at the end of tabulating all this, what was worked out was a an event would happen in each one of those cities. And um, we had representatives of management that would be the speakers and talk about their areas. So Executive Director International, Guillaume, speaking of top management and the exec strata, Senior CS International, the technical side and um, how standard tech and new tech that was coming out or what have you. Um, <clears throat> there was a representative from RTC at that time. At the first of the events, it was Vicky that was at those. We also had Heber Jens as president of the church. Um, and those were the key figures initially. And we started in Los Angeles as the first event. We then did um, San Francisco. Um, we went to Florida, Clearwater, Florida, did did event there, did back-to-back -back, like a Saturday and Sunday, New York, and then Boston. And what was done was the speakers came out and talked about their areas, as I mentioned, but then afterwards they would be in the lobby and you could go up to them and, you know, shake hands with them, talk to them, which addressed then the, the approachableness that the public wanted. There so, were, go ahead. Oh, so I was gonna say, this is really interesting. Project Handle the Public, then the, the survey is we don't know who's leading the church. So, so really the, the new church leadership, could, because then L. Ron Hubbard's off lines, he's up at his ranch in Creston. So they just want to, it's, it's sort of get out and meet the public. Correct. You know, meet, meet Scientologists, say, hey, look, uh, we're the people who are running the church and we're here and we're available. Correct. And this is interesting because in a, a structure like Scientology, where it, it, it had always been L. Ron Hubbard as the predominant figure, as a cult of personality, if you will, when someone that central is gone, there were all kinds of rumors going around. And so, so when you're looking at what you said, the people who were against you, sitting on the fence and then for you, what were the results of Project Handle the Public where people, did they become satisfied that they knew what was going on with the church? The results of that were very positive. Um, there was an issue that came out later that I think was just written maybe first as a dispatch and turned into an issue from um, L. Ron Hubbard and it was called What Raised International and Author Services Statistics and listed out a bunch of points on that. And several of those were directly uh, my guess off the top would be like five of the items were directly related to having done those events and addressing the public. Where is Suzette Hubbard in all this? And you, you and Suzette, do you see her occasionally? Are you dating? Are you mailing letters? Like what, what is her job or post, as you call it, in the church at this time? I mean, how often do you see Suzette? Well, when I was on this project, not at all. Um, because we were traveling all over the world, you know. Um, once back in Los Angeles, the project was, uh, the personnel from the project were still um, active and um, a proposal was done to take that unit and make it the International Public Relations Unit for International Management, which was approved. So it stayed together as a function. I was in in that unit, and that was in Los Angeles, in um, at the complex, a big blue building there. Suzette was in uh, Commodore's Messenger Org Extension Unit, International Extension Unit. The Commodore's Messenger Org International was at the base out in Hemet. Um, they had an extension arm, and this unit was in PAC, just because the Los Angeles Pacific Area Command 
was as big as it was. So I would run into Suzette. She was doing a lot of uh, personnel at the time, getting personnel for different missions. Um, she would come by the office and say hi, and um, we would we then were able to talk more freely. On the RPF and the running program, you're with a bunch of people. An RPF member also is not to originate to people outside the RPF. Um, and certainly, you can't create a relationship while you're on the RPF. So um, we s s continue talking. This is now um, 83 going into 84. And what happens is this the that unit that I was in continues in 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 Los Angeles, but I went on to a I got the clearances and I went into the office of Edie Ant and was posted in the marketing area. Okay, so l let me follow you. Project Handle the Public becomes the International Public Relations Unit. And for you, for management. For management, okay. And then you get transferred into the office of the Executive Director International. Correct. And and just for new Scientology listeners, Scientology is very rich with acronyms, and so the Executive Director is called ED Int. So you you're working now in the office of the Executive Director in what capacity? Um, Marketing Exec International. I wanted to make it to say too that the the public relations unit was also directly attached to the executive strata of which ED International ran. He's ED International, and then he has specialists on different functions. Um, and so the PR arm was connected to that office. Okay, now so when you're the marketing executive international for the Church of Scientology, that's a big job. That's a big job, yeah. How do you market Scientology? How do you market it? How do you sell it? Well, we're, <clears throat> what we had, then, especially strong at that time, was the um, um, Dianetics unit that Jeff Hawkins was over. Um, and they were doing basic book marketing. The idea that if you sell a lot of books, those people are then interested and you create a boom of an inflow of people who have read those books. So his unit is pushing Dianetics, the volcano ads come out, the, it, it, you know, putting it back on a bestseller list. And so you had that on the front lines. Then we were taking and upgrading um, the presentation and materials, you know? Um, so let's say you had a lecture series and it was repackaged into um, binders at that time. Uh, for the training levels, you would have the tapes in one binder and the pack that all the materials were in another, and they would look the same. So, you know, if you were on level zero, you'd have the course pack and the tapes that went with it, level one, etc. So, new materials, um, making sure that the promo promotional functions are being done by individual orgs, that they're getting their magazines out, that they have all of their points of promotion in, in an organization, right? Which you could push on that 24 seven forever to get that to happen. So required me to go down. So I'm now at the, at the international base. It and some of the units were now in Los Angeles. So I would go to Los Angeles on a regular basis. And so that's how in person, um, Suzette and I, built that relationship. Now, was she, now the international base is down in uh, Gilman Hot Springs. So was Suzette working at Gilman Hot Springs and you're working in LA? Um, no, I was at Gilman Hot Springs where the okay. office okay. of ED International was and Suzette was in that extension unit, which was in Los Angeles. So in person, I would need to be in Los Angeles and just so happened that I would be there regularly just by the nature of um, the position that I had. Now that's really, that's interesting because Jeff Hawkins, you know, he, he did really create quite a movement with commercials and I've interviewed him about the um, television, um, television commercials he created. It was very in innovative marketing. 
Mm -hmm. And did you have a, did the statistics increase? Did more people come into Scientology out of this campaign? You know, um, I don't recall. I know that Jeff's statistics on selling the books was certainly there. Yeah. Um, how much inflow spilled over to the organizations, um, I couldn't say. Um, so what happens is this is now um, 1984. Suzette and I get married in March of 86. So over this two-year period, the relationship builds. I'm in Los Angeles and see here, and then I go back to the base, and then I'm in Los Angeles. We also had a system whereby specifically designed for the Scientology organizations where you could communicate through computer messages and which is you know very simple now but in 1984 um it was like cutting edge um <clears throat> so we could continue to stay in communication with messages and we did and frequently there was um very happy dialogue telling jokes and and um just keeping keeping things alive long distance through that messaging system then when we could be together in Los Angeles, then we would get together. Now, was there a time where you said, hey, uh, Suzette, let's go on a date or let's, you know, be an item? I mean, uh, was there an understanding that your relationship was developing? It was an understanding that the relationship was developing. It was never a specific dialogue, um, but it was certainly developing, yes. Yeah, you were devoted to each other exclusively yeah. and... And when you're when you're in the Sea Org and you're you're dating Ron and Mary Sue's daughter, did that create problems for you, or were people fine with it? Like, how was Mary Sue? How was her mother? <clears throat> her mother. Well, at one point, I met Mary Sue for the first time, and that one was very smooth, and I liked her, and um, so that was that was fine. There is um, because it's. L. Ron Hubbard and Mary Sue's daughter, I had put a request to marry Suzette and that was supposed to get to L. Ron Hubbard. He was then up at Creston near San Luis Obispo on the ranch where he died. And um, that request never got to him um, before he died. Hmm. I was speaking to someone recently who was in the unit where it was where that you know request was, and he told me that people didn't know what to do with it, so it kind of just moved around and um, never went up. He then LRH then dies in January when we were planning to already planning to get married. Um, now this is interesting. Let's stop for a minute. Okay, so. L. Ron Hubbard dies when you're, you and Suzette are planning to get married. How did Suzette learn of her father's death? As you know, there were, was the uh, announcement of this mandatory event that all the staff and public were to go to. And Suzette and I were going to go to that event together. As the time came to leave, she let me know that she couldn't go. She was being called over someplace else. What happened at that someplace else was that Suzette was told her father died. And as she told it to me, um, the children, Suzette, her sister Diana and brother Arthur, were taken one by one by one, handled one by one by one. So as Suzette tells me, the um, she's in this room, told her father died. She's handed this piece of paper. Um, what she signs and she told me what she signed without even reading it was kind of went like your father's dead and this is what he wanted your father's died and this is what he wanted and so suzette tells me of course you know there's the initial loss of course anything that he wanted you know this the event happens then it's over and now i'm in this um exec executive strata and ed international also had offices in Los Angeles to use while we were there. So he was there and I was there and I could see Suzette came, was walking in in the hallway that you could see by the door and she was looking in. I saw it, Edie Ant saw it and he turned to me and he says, go be with her. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the like 
kindest, warmest things that um, I experienced in the C organization. You know, no matter what was going on, the hum humanity was recognized by Guillaume, which it could maybe doesn't sound like a big deal to to someone who's listening, but production always comes first, you know? So anything that that is a distraction to production, you want to move aside, you know? And anyway, so then I went with Suzette and... Um, well, well, how did she take the news of her father's death? She was um, shocked and she was ang angry, you know, because she wasn't there. She, the family was not informed when he was sick, including Mary Sue. Um, family wasn't informed when he had his first stroke, wasn't informed when he had his second stroke, wasn't informed that he was dying. Um, so she was upset that she didn't have that opportunity to say the goodbyes, wrap up anything that's incomplete. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly. No, no, no last goodbyes. Now, did you take Did you take Suzette over to see her mother, Mary Sue? I mean, did the family did she, Did she and her sister and brother get together with their mother? Um, if they did, I wasn't included. But Suzette was back at the the you know the uh, the complex, the big blue building, after the event, as was I, and we spent that time together so she wasn't with her brother and sister or at mary sue's did the, if they did that at a later time I, I i don't know we know that the last two years of his life dr dank was up at the ranch with with mr hubbard yes. and ron hubbard was not in good health he, no in fact in the uh, the sheriff coroner's report as far as I can figure from the documents, you know, and I have the, the, the coroner's report and the extensive documentation posted up my blog, The Scientology Money Project. L. Ron Harbor's living in a, a luxury Bluebird motorhome. Yes. And, and, and although he has a very nice house, he's sort of like, he'll have a, a beautiful marble fireplace installed and he doesn't like it and orders it ripped out. He builds a horse racing track. He has buffalo and other llamas and exotic animals up there. Mm -hmm. Pat Broker is up there with his wife, Annie, and they're taking care of Ron. And then Stephen Falfer, Sarge, is the ranch hand. Mm -hmm. And they have local construction workers always doing things on fences and you know these buildings and things. So really what happens is Pat Broker makes phone calls to David Miscavige and they meet and David Miscavige brings up correspondence and money and Pat gives orders from Ron to David Miscavige. Mm -hmm. We know that in hindsight, right? Yes. But they've com completely cut Ron, L. Ron Hubbard off from his family. Yeah, there, you know, there's a couple things I would add there. One, you mentioned the coroner's report. Um, some years after that, when I'm no longer in the C organization. I went by myself, didn't even tell Suzette at the time, up to San Luis Obispo and um, got the the coroner's report. I pulled his death certificate and got the coroner's report and sat on it for a while um, before I showed Suzette. And when I did show Suzette, she was, again, sad and angry. Um, sad because she knew from the report on the condition of his body with like you know long fingernails and and he was just unkempt so that he was a proud man and that would never be the case so she she, she said that in reading that she knew that he was not being taken care of oh, in absolutely. those in those last you know months or weeks or years sure and, and robert von young uh made a video which i have on on my money project there's um the death of l ron hubbard 
Von Young said he's somewhat like Howard Hughes. His hair is unkempt. He, he he's unshaven. His fingernails are long. And and Hubbard was always so fastidious in his grooming. He was, and specifically, Suzette mentioned his hands, right? That he yeah. they were always the grooming was in, and his, that what was said about the fingernails. She knew that if he was in his right mind, that's not how his body would have been. If he was being cared for. That's not how he would have been if the care was good. So she um, was sad that that was, you know. Well, sure, if your, your own father was not being taken care of. I have a, a, a quote. Um, <clears throat> the sheriff coroner notes in his report that he talked to Dr. Denk. And Dr. Denk said he'd been there for about two years taking care of L. Ron Hubbard. Now, Hubbard had a stroke about eight days before he died, his first stroke. Mm -hmm. And that gave him what's called dysphagia. It means you really can't, you slur your words, you, you can't read material. Mm -hmm. And then he uh, he was treated with this, of course, with a psychiatric tranquilizer visceral. Mm -hmm. I think that he had a stroke much earlier than that. Well, well possibly, I, yeah. Yeah, I, and I'm just but talking the, about the, the, the last 10 days of his life. Okay, okay. And, um, He's given this psychiatric drug, and it's not for, for allergies, as the church has tried to claim. It's a psychiatric tranquilizer that is indicated for elderly patients. It's a hospice drug. They're dying. It helps them pass. Mm. And, and um, what's interesting is the church attorney, Earl Cooley, after Ron dies, uh, David Miscavige and company make the long drive from, from Gilman Hot Springs to Creston. And church attorney Earl Cooley shows up mm -hmm. and they notify the sheriff coroner. And there's quite a delay that the sheriff coroner knows. There's a long time between Ron dying and, and, and the sheriff coroner being notified. Mm -hmm. And um, Earl Cooley is the executor once Ron's body cremated right away. There was a new law passed in California that if you, you didn't have to have a, a, an autopsy due to religious beliefs. Right, and, and so the sheriff coroner realizes this is L. Ron Hubbard who's just passed away. I'm not releasing the body for cremation. There could be foul play. Right. And that's actually noted in the coroner's report. He said, we're going to take blood samples and fingerprints, and then I'll release the body. Mm -hmm. and, and this is what's, what, I, what I think is particularly malicious, and it goes to the document Suzette and her siblings were made to sign. Cooley says, okay, take the fingerprints and the blood samples. And that's how they find the visceral. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they got, the sheriff coroner got what he had, Cooley has the body cremated and he sets there the whole time, mm -hmm. for the whole process. And they, they literally scatter Ron's ashes as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And it's a small boat. It's like David Miscavige, Heber, a couple other people are in a small boat and they scatter the ashes. Mm -hmm. And then this is when they concoct the narrative that L. Ron Hubbard was a strong, healthy Thetan, Earl Cooley said at the death event at the Palladium here in Hollywood, right. who, could, who could have chosen to continue on for many years in his vital, healthy body, but instead he causatively dropped the body. And they made it sound like he laid down on his bed and just left the body. Right. And... Did Suzette believe that? Did you believe it? Did the rank and file believe it? You know, um, I believe that many people believed it. If people doubted it, um, it wasn't expressed. I know personally, I went to that event and it was like, something's not right here. You can just feel it and sense it. Um, I want to add, too, that Suzette in 2009, so... Her father dies in 86, January of 86. In 2009, on her own, she goes up to talk to the sheriff. And our oldest son is with her. So it's just Suzette and Tyson. They go up there. Suzette wanted to know why the family was not informed or told. Why weren't, why weren't they told that he, he, when he died, that he had died? Why weren't they, you know, called up ahead of time? Um, and she was told that the sheriff was told that he was 
separated from his wife. Now I can say that yes, physically they were separated in multiple conversations with Mary Sue after the fact. Um, she didn't consider that they were separated as uh, uh, a couple or that it was final. Um, one time in particular, she told me that when she sees him, she's got things to say to him. She is angry and um, they had an agreement that she would go first because her job was always as guardian or controller, you know, making things safe. Um, so, yes, she said she has some words for him when she sees him um, and is angry. She was also... Um, so she's stuck. Mary Sue is stuck on what happened. Suzette is stuck on what happened. Why weren't we informed? Um, I remember one thing with Mary Sue where she, um, uh, we were at her house and she wanted to show me something. And she pulls out this ring and she said that it was recently given to her and that it had supposedly been stolen by Pat Broker. And so it never got to her. But this is what LRH wanted her to have and thank her for all of her contributions and, you know, a as a token of love if he were dying. And I remember, you know, that didn't feel right either. Like it was this, she was, she, her attention was on the fact that she wasn't there when he died. Her attention was on the fact that she wasn't there on his care. And I remember, um, you can see it also in the, in the, um, um, Declaration of Jesse Prinz, where she wants to know, did he have anything to say to her? Was there, she's just hungry for what those words are. L. Ron Hubbard and Mary Sue are a married couple in the state of California. Therefore, everything Ron has is community property and belongs to Mary Sue Hubbard. Correct. Including all of the literary rights all the intellectual property that constitutes the bulk of Scientology. Correct. These belong to Mary Sue Hubbard and their children. <clears throat> by, by rights of inheritance, wanted to wrest this away. Jerry Armstrong, when he was working with Omar Garrison on the biography of L. Ron Hubbard. Yes. Uh, he went to church management and courageously said, look, you're going to have to take out these lies about L. Ron Hubbard's biography, he was not a war hero. He was not a nuclear physicist. And apparently Norman Starkey went nuclear mm. on him and they just couldn't have it. Mm -hmm. and, and and Jerry fled taking things with him and he introduced into the, uh, they sued to get the materials back and Jerry introduced L. Ron Hubbard's uh, affirmations or admissions, they're, they're called either. And this is, you know, the, the Thelemic black magic he did with Jack Parsons in the 40s. Mm -hmm. And there were some other, uh, other things. Now, L. Ron Hubbard, these were his papers, but he couldn't sue to get them back because that would mean he could be deposed in a court of law. He would right. have to appear in a court of law. So what does the church do? They go to Mary Sue and say, sue to get your community property back. And she does. Yes. So the, the church wants it both ways. Right. When, right. they, when they need her to do damage control, she's absolutely married to L. Ron Hubbard and she's the wife and it's their community property. Mm -hmm. Now, when Hubbard dies, they, the kids are in grief because they've lost their father mm -hmm. and he was their father. Yeah. And they, they sign this, sign this. They right. don't have an attorney present. They're not advised. No. They're signing. They're in a state of shock. Yeah. Okay, that's the one thing that's... that's uh, just criminal on the church's part. Yeah, and they're not with them with Mary Sue. No, no, they're not with their mother. No. They're not together. It's sort of one by one by one. And no attorney. Well, this is very much a David Miscavige thing, right? And then, as we know from uh, Marty Rathbun and, and other sources, uh, when Mary Sue, after Ron dies, they go and they gang up on her. They send a whole big goon squad over to her house here in Los Feliz. 
and they demanding that she turn over all the rights, all of the rights. She signed off on them. And she tells them no, but they just grind on her, threaten her, wear her down. Did she ever not, talk? They're not to leave until they have that. Did, yeah. Did she ever talk to you about that event? Did she give you her version of it? She did not. She did not. You know, because Guy, I know that that you became very close to uh, Mary Sue. She was your mother-in-law. Mm-hmm. What what kind of person was she? Mary Sue was gracious. She had um, southern charm. Um, she also could just be not serious. Um, a, a particular pleasure that I had was watching her play with her grandchildren, my children, and see that simple act um, where she was happy. And I thought it was just priceless against, you know, the background of she took the fall, she went to jail, she went, aside from all that, just the human element, here's a grandmother with her grandchildren and they are enjoying the moment and she's laughing. And, you know, that was just priceless. When Ron disappeared and he went off lines and, and Suzette and, the, and her brother and sister couldn't see Ron, that was, they weren't allowed to talk about it, were they? Did, I mean, did Suzette, ever con, did Suzette ever confide in you that, hey, I don't get to see my father? She did. She did mention it. And she was not happy with it and that so much time had gone by. And, um, yeah, she was not happy with that. But if she asked the church authorities... The executive director or David Miscavige had like to go see my father. They would have said no. Not going to happen. Correct. Yeah, was not going to happen. Was she allowed to exchange letters? Write letters to her. Uh, you know, I saw no letters received or given from Suzette to him while we were together in that period up to, you know, his death. Well, they certainly uh, the, the church got the rights away from the family. They were worth hun- hundreds of millions of dollars. Yes. You know, I think I think it's important to know, too, that the background here is that there were multiple. You know, there was a reason why he was in hiding, you know, there were he had he had legal problems and there was a whole project called All Clear, which was to get all that resolved so that he could move where he wanted to move. It was always, for example, that he was going to come back to that to the base there in in. um, Gilman Hot Springs, um, you know, it was expected that he was going to be back on the lines, but what had to happen was all clear. And so that's why he's hiding out. Um, and it was always used as a reason why, yeah, why you couldn't contact him. Yeah, L. Ron Hubbard was, was sued in numerous lawsuits and people wanted to depose him. He had engaged in uh, income tax evasion, money laundering. And there were all kinds of threats, and he knew he had to go in hiding. So when he leaves um, the Hemet area, you know, to, and he had a couple of ranches around, and he goes around, and he finally settles up in Creston. Um, Mary Sue's already been taken offline. She's uh, made a non-person, basically, right? And then this is where they get her the house, Ron buys her the house in Los Feliz on Chiselhurst. Yes. Yeah. And what year was that where she, where she got the house on Chislehurst? Do you recall? I'm not certain. I'm not yeah. certain because when I met her, she already already had the house. I believe it happened like um, when she got out of jail. There was a place that was rented before, and you know, I believe she went to the house after jail. Now, you have to remember, this being the Church of Scientology, very much a a culture of surveillance control. Mary Sue wasn't allowed to just live in a house and come and go as she pleased. She had a handler named Neville Potter, a couple Mm -hmm. other people, right? Mm -hmm. What what kind of control system did the church set up for Mary Sue? Would you say she was under house arrest or did she have relative freedom of movement? What was her day-to-day life like? Um. Well, she had, there were four people at the house, um, Neville and his wife, Leslie, and there was a um, 
person who primarily did the cooking and a person who primarily did the cleaning. So, you know, she was there and, and four people. Um, so that was the, that was the setup. And I understand that you know, daily reports were going from Neville to David Miscavige. You know, the, this might be a, a good point to say that at one point, which led to my leaving, um, when I asked what the plan was for Mary Sue, I was specifically told to let her live out her life. Hmm. So that's, she's in that house and it's to let her live out her life. So she's going to die in the house. She'll die in the house and she did die in the house, you know, and yeah. you know, the, 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 that, comment is more on my leaving Scientology, you know, that was the, the turning point because it was um, when I was told, you know, w what's going to be done about Mary Sue, before that it was pretty much implied that it was thought that she was a suppressive person. Guy, going back, uh, you know, we've been talking about Mary Sue, but going back, what date were you and Suzette Hubbard married? We were married um, March 8th. And at the time, we planned on getting married. And as I mentioned, I had that proposal there. When he died, it's like, I don't need his approval. So Suzette and I were planning on moving ahead with that wedding. We had some hurdles to figure out. Like, if the wedding was up lines where I was at that base, there were friends of Suzette's in Los Angeles that didn't have clearance to go there, so they wouldn't be able to go to the wedding. If we had the wedding local where they could go, like, for example, uh, Celebrity Center, um, Mary Sue would not be able to go because it's a point of security. Um, so it, after that, it was then decided, well, we would get married at Mary Sue's house and it would be a very, very small wedding. Um, and But what ha ha actually happened was it was a Saturday and Suzette and I went down to the Justice of the Peace, got married, went from there, back to our post to work that afternoon. So that was March 8, 1986. Correct. You go downtown to the courthouse, you get married, and then you go back to work. Yep. No honeymoon. No. Honeymoons weren't a thing in the sea organization. I don't know of anyone who ever had a honeymoon. Well, I, yeah, the whole and time that, I was there. And that's appalling. Guy, what's it like? Uh, does Suzette change her name to Suzette White, or does she keep the Hubbard name? She kept... Um, she, she became Hubbard White. Hubbard White. Uh -huh. Mary Rochelle, Mary Suzette Rochelle Hubbard White. What's it, what's it like for you as a CERG member when you're married to the Commodore's daughter? You know, it became, um, I mean, that was definitely a turning point <laughs> in my life. And it became, there were things that were just kind of like House of Mirrors, you know, because um, on one hand, you would have things that were, um, well, I'll, talk, I'll give you an example. I was on the RPF when, when Tyson was born. Suzette had been moved up lines. So, you know, uh, with... Uh, for probably a good part of her pregnancy and then moved back to Los Angeles so there would be easy access to a hospital as needed and it turned out we didn't need the hospital so um, I was then on the RPF up there at Gilman Hot Springs and was transferred with my twin to Los Angeles when Tyson was born so I'm there at the hospital for the birth and and um, then at some point I need to leave from there and go back to the, um, complex and the RPF and what have you. Right. And I have a call from, or I called Mary Sue to let her know what's going on. And she was like, you, you know, you need to get back up there, right? You should be at that hospital. And, and it, from a Sea Org member, I should be on, on the RPF and accountable there not missing from the RPF, you know, from family, Mary Sue's view, I should be up there at the hospital, right? Well, sure. Um, the, the, 
you know, another example of the oddities would be, well, Suzette and I were married on March 8th, and then there was March 13th event, right? And, you know, there was no big announcement that we were married, right? But on a public display of affection, then I'm tapped on the shoulder. It's like, you know, that's Ellen Hubbard's daughter. And then I said, well, you know, we were married. So, you know. <laughs> Guy, this is so strange that even though you're married to Suzette Hubbard, this does not spare you from the RPF. You know, I think it made it worse. When yeah. I was on the RPF, uh, John Horwich, who was Diana Hubbard's husband and the, and the father of Roanne, he was on the RPF, as was Arthur. So all the male family members were all on the RPF at the same time. Um, now, I've heard that know, Su Suzette Hubbard had to become... David Miscavige's laundress. She was the laundress after the um, after Tyson was born, and I was on the RPF. Yeah. So, uh, so David Miscavige was out to humiliate Elrond Hubbard's family, show them who's boss. You know, I think uh, certainly. You know, when I was on, um, I was on that RPF, and it was canceled because it was done by someone who just wanted me on the RPF. Um, Vicky Azarin. And when she was then busted and driven out to the Happy Valley where the RPF was, you know, staying when they weren't working, um, that's where they slept. Yeah. Um, when she arrived out there, I knew I was off. And I asked, got the board of review, and I was off the RPF. It was canceled. I go back onto my post in marketing, right? And then one day, a personnel order is shown to me, and I'm assigned to be the clapper gold in the film unit. Yeah. And that's, you know, scene one, take two, clap, so you're syncing the sound and the, and the, and the film. And there was no action you know there was no no um it was very awkward because sure. so here i am with this group new group i'm now not in the exec strat i'm in gold staff and um being told you know you must have really fucked up right <laughs> to, yeah. to fall from international management and now you're the clapper you know and there was no ethics action there was no nothing was done then um ronnie miscavige david's brother is then on my post he had been recovered he was in the crg earlier in the commodore's messenger York. he was recovered and when he was recovered he was put on that post now i like ronnie i have a problem with him and i understand he did a good job there but in terms of me and my post there was really no reason other than to demoralize degrade um to put me on that post remove me from the post i was on that that's just that's just mind bending. Guys, I'd like to, uh, we're coming up on an hour. I'd like to, to end on this and on part two, pick up, you know, part two of, uh, of your marriage to Suzette and how you left the church and what happened afterwards. Okay. This Great. is a lot of, a, a lot of valuable information. I really appreciate your input and we'll go to, we'll go to part two. So for Surviving Scientology Radio, this is your host, Jeffrey Augustine. We've been interviewing Guy White. Stay tuned for part two. And as always, thank you for listening.